Okay. <clears throat> so now in part two, we look at the Isaiah text. So uh, we open up our Masoretic text, you know, get get a Hebrew Bible if you don't have one. You know, it's it's fun to study the Word of God in the Hebrew, in the original languages. And open your Bible to 40, chapter 41, verses 20, 25 and 26, okay? <clears throat> so <clears throat> right here we go. And uh, let's let's read through the text. Okay, so in uh, it's Sefer Yeshaya Perek Mem Aleph. So it's the book of Isaiah, chapter forty-one, and in verse uh, twenty-five, and it states: It says, "Ha'iroti mitzafon ve'yat mimizrach shemesh yikra vishmi ve'yavo." Segani Seganim Kemo Homer Uchmo Yotzer Yermas Tit. Okay, so I've, I've raised up from uh, Mitzaphon, from the north. Okay, and he shall come from the rising of the sun. He shall call upon my name, and he shall call upon my on princes, upon uh, mortar, and as the potter treads clay. Okay, and in verse 26. It says, Mi higid merosh ve neda'a u milfanim ve nomar tzadik af ein megid af ein mashmia af ein shomea im rechem. Okay, so <clears throat> who has declared from the beginning that he may know and before that he may say he is righteous? Yes, there is none that show, there is none that declares, there is none that hear your words. Okay, <laughs> so here we note again how these verses are a larger set, are a set of a larger um, section of Isaiah scriptures that challenge the idols and the false gods of the nations. We note some of the difficulties in the text, you know, uh, for example, where it says, uh, Let's see, where's that at? Oh, right here. Um, Yikra bi, um, bishmi. Okay, so the, the idea is that he will call upon my name. Okay, so um, the reason that, like, for example, this is a difficult text is because to whom are these words referring? You know, is it referring to King Cyrus? You know, do, did Cyrus actually call upon the name of God, the God of Israel? You know, there's no record of him doing so. So the point is that there's no archaeological evidence or biblical evidence that the king had called upon the name of God. But we do note here in Ezra, Ezra something. <coughs> Read through Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He says, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it in also into writing, saying, Thus says... Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, okay, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, okay, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people. His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem, and whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold, and with goods and with beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Okay, so here, according to Ezra, he says that Cyrus the king was motivated to declare that the Lord God of heaven had given me all the kingdoms of the earth, right, right here. And suggesting that he was aware that God had given him his position and power to conquer the kingdoms of the earth. So this perhaps is what Isaiah is prophesying of. In regards to the one calling upon the name of God here in the, the Isaiah text. And we note how Cyrus destroyed Babylon, the Babylonian rule, right? And then allowed God's people to return to the promised land. And so we note how Cyrus foreshadowed the true Messiah of God in some of the things that he did. And we note the similarities or the parallels that are laid out in the Isaiah text according to this messianic figure. So I have here <coughs> some parallels and similarities. And so, for example, being chosen and empowered by God to accomplish his purpose, okay, 
being called by God's name and acting as his representative, okay, and being victorious over their enemies and bringing salvation to God's people, okay. And then the next is the differences between the Messiah sent of God and Cyrus, okay. So Cyrus, he is a human king who rules by military force and political power. Cyrus was a Gentile, right, who did not know God personally, Cyrus is a temporal deliverer who frees the Jewish people from physical captivity. <laughs> or on the other hand, we look at Yeshua. Yeshua is the divine son of God who rules by grace and truth. Yeshua is a Jewish man who revealed God to the world, the God of Israel to the world, right? And Yeshua is called an eternal redeemer who frees the people from spiritual bondage. Okay, and we can see these verses from all over Isaiah that uh, we can we read, weave together this this narrative regarding who Yeshua is, okay, and as the Redeemer. And we note that these verses are not like in chapter twenty one, verses twenty five to twenty six. They these two verses here are not directly quoted and applied to Yeshua in the New Testament text, but they are part of the background and the context. Of the mess of the messianic expectation that Yeshua fulfills. Okay, so the New Testament writers often use the language and the imagery of Isaiah to describe Yeshua and his ministry that fit within this pattern of mess messianic expectation. <laughs> Take for example, Yeshua is called the light of the world who shines in the darkness. You know, Isaiah 9 and John chapter 8, right? And Yeshua is called the servant of God who suffers for the sins of the people, Isaiah 53 and Mark chapter 10. Yeshua is the, the cornerstone who is rejected by the builders, Isaiah 28, Matthew 21, right? Yeshua is the one who calls upon God's name and does his will, Isaiah 41 and John chapter 17. Yeshua is the one who comes with power and glory to judge the nations and save his people, Isaiah chapter 40, Revelation chapter 19. And in addition to these things, the verses from Isaiah 41, verses 25 and 26 here that we're looking at are also used in the Tanakh to demonstrate the contrast between the power and authority of the true God to the false gods of the nations. To summarize again, the idols of the nations are unable to predict or control the future, and they are powerless and worthless. Okay, so the Lord God of Israel, on the other hand, knows the end from the beginning and he accomplishes his plan through his chosen agent. You know, here we see Cyrus in chapter 41. And in Isaiah 41, the Lord God of Israel challenges the idols and their followers to prove their identity, their divinity, right? By declaring what will happen and then bring that thing to pass, right? And this is the delineating factor that establishes the God of Israel as Lord over all. You know, God of Israel also invites his people to trust in him and not fear, for he is with them and he will help them. And so <clears throat> we see that in Isaiah 41, verses 10 to 14. And he also provided historical evidence as a basis for trusting in him. So the conclusions that we obtain from these verses, verses 25 and 26, is to expect that the Lord God will rise up a deliverer and be God's instrument for deliverance and salvation. We note that Cyrus is a type of Mashiach, right? But he does not fulfill the prophecies in Isaiah in the deeper way as Yeshua did, according to the New Testament text. So we also note that Isaiah is predicting these events of King Cyrus 160 years prior in advance, right? With stunning accuracy, and this is evidence in and of itself of the power of God over history. So we note that the challenges to the idols of the nations is supposed or is supported by the historical proof of the scriptures. And to the idols, um, these, these things should lead everyone who read these texts, right? <laughs> who read these texts that we find in the scriptures and that who study the archaeological evidence to have faith in the Almighty God of Israel. And so history bears record of the power of God, and similarly in our lives as witnesses bearing the testimony of God in our lives. And again, what we find here is this consistent historical record 
of the of God in our lives. And this is the evidence for these things is how God transforms us from the inside out for his glory and for his service. Our lives parallel these things that we are reading here in the scriptures. And if we say we have faith and our lives don't parallel these things, then we should ask serious questions whether we truly believe in the God of Israel and his Messiah Yeshua. You know, faith involves being faithful and which is the earmark of our faith you know when we actually live our lives for the glory of god according to his word right so again <clears throat> this is how god bears testimony of his great power in and through the lives of his people you know it's, it's a fantastic thing okay so <clears throat> next verse we're looking at is is cha- verse 27 so uh the the text is, says um rishon letzion hine hinam ulirushlaim um mevasar at 10 okay so um the first shall say to zion behold behold them and i will give jerusalem one that brings good tidings okay and and brings the the besara right that that's where we see this uh this word here for besara for the the gospel right the good news and so here in Isaiah 41, verse 27, in the Hebrew Bible, the word um, mevaser, okay, is a participle, singular, absolute, from the root word basar, meaning news or heralder of good tidings. And uh, so this word connects us straight back to the New Testament text and the Gospel of Mark when we are told that Yeshua is the one who is being spoken of here, the one who brings the good news to Zion and Jerusalem. So the Gospel of Mark begins his book with the quotation from Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Isaiah 41, verse 27. So let's look at that. And it says here, <coughs> we'll look at three scriptures here. And so uh, in Mark 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice crying in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And in Isaiah 43, 40, verse 3, um, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then here, 41, verse 27, The first shall say to Zion, Behold, them behold behold them and i will give to jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings okay so uh we notice how mark portrays yeshua as the one who fulfills the prophecies of isaiah bringing the one who proclaims the good news that suffering servant like we read in isaiah 53 and the light to the nations again we note how this follows from the idea that uh isaiah 41 is a challenge to the idols of the nations to prove their power in knowing the future, in in manipulating the future, right? In doing what they declare, right? Like God, the God of Israel does. You know, here, the Lord God is declaring the future characteristics of his Mashiach, right? And in, in the Jewish tradition, this verse is also interpreted messianically as referring to the future redemption of Israel by the Messiah, and some rabbis identify the messenger of the good news as Elijah, who is expected to announce the coming of the Messiah. Others see the messenger as the Messiah himself, who will restore the glory of Zion in Jerusalem. And so we note how historically the God of Israel established his authority and his word to do what he said he would do. And this is something the gods of the nations could not do. And this is the context of Zion and Jerusalem in regards to the messenger God is rising to bring the good news. And he, he comes in the power and the authority of God. And note, this is how the Targum and the Septuagint understand this as well. So we look here at the Septuagint, and it says that um, I, will, I will give dominion to Zion, and I will encourage Jerusalem. And in the Targum, it says the words of consolation, which the prophets prophesied from old, concerning zion behold they shall come to pass and unto jerusalem i will give one that bringeth good tidings and so the septuagint uh indicates how god has concern for zion and jerusalem and the targum emphasizes how god has given his prophetic words to the prophets and states that god's word will come to pass 
Uh, so the Septuagint and the Targum differ in some details <coughs> in comparison to the Hebrew text. The Hebrew Bible says that God was the first to say to Zion, right? Rishon, right? Um, let's see, where was that again? Uh, he says, uh, he was, um, yeah, Rishon, let's right? He was the first to Zion, right? And that uh, first to say, behold, behold them, right? Hine Hinam, right, right here. And to Jerusalem, right? And to Jerusalem, um, I give the good news, right? And these things imply a near future context that God announced the return of the exiles from Babylon before anyone else, and that he sent a prophet to proclaim the good news of their restoration. And the Targum speaks of the words of consolation that the prophets prophesied from of old concerning Zion. He says, Behold, they shall come to pass into Jerusalem. I will give one that brings this good news. Okay, so this implies that the prophets predicted the return of the exile from, the Bab from Babylon long ago, and that God fulfilled their words by sending a messenger of good news. And so the Septuagint states that God will first notice give notice to Zion and will comfort Jerusalem by the way. And this implies that God will inform Zion of his plans and to restore the exiles from Babylon and will com comfort Jerusalem along the way. And again, <coughs> all these sp things speak to the loving God that we serve and provide material and historical reasons to trust and believe in him. And then uh, the last the last verses here in our uh, that we're looking at for tonight, verse 20 and 29, it says, Ve'era ve'ain ish u me'ela ve'ain yotzets yo yoets ve'ashalim ve'yashivu devar. Okay, so for I beheld, and there was no man among them, and there is no counselor that uh, when I asked of them could answer a word. And then hen kulam aven fs ma'asechem ruach. But tohu niskehem. Okay, so that behold, they are all vain, right? Empty. They're empty. Their works are are nothing, and their molten images are wind and confusion, right? And so here, these verses are the conclusion of God's challenge to the idols, <coughs> and to those who worship these idols in relation to the one whom God is going to rise up. As a deliverer, and this is in reference to King Cyrus, who would deliver Israel from Babylon. Now, the contrast is again is to the idols that are nothing, and they are just wooden, stone, and metal. And we note in Isaiah forty-one twenty-eight that the word <coughs> man, ish, can also mean husband, implying that the idols behave like an unfaithful spouse does, who who cannot uh, give counsel, they can't comfort. To their can't give comfort to their lovers, you know. So if anyone has experienced an unfaithful spouse, one can really grasp the concept of the futility of the relationship. And it is in the same vein of thought that Isaiah is contrasting the futility of the idols and the faithfulness of God. Okay, so the Lord God Almighty chose Israel as His servant, and will not forsake them, but will strengthen them and help them against their enemies. And in Isaiah forty-one verse twenty-nine. This, this word aven, right, is for iniquity, is used. And um, they, they, uh, it's translated in the King James as vanity, right? And um, it, it means iniquity or wickedness. And this implies that the idols are not only useless, but they're also evil and corrupt. And they add evil and corruption because sin, uh, it transmigrates, right? It, it, it uh, multiplies, right? And uh, so idolatry promotes ungodliness and wickedness, what we see here in this word. And this is apparent in our culture today. You know, it's easy to just look around. And also in Isaiah 41, verse 29, the word ruach, right here, is uh, for wind, is uh, <coughs> can also have reference to spirit or to breath. And the idea of the wind and confusion implies that the idols have no life or power of their own, but depend on their makers and their worshipers. So Isaiah 41 verses 28 to 29 here fits into the narrative of Isaiah chapter 41 by declaring to Zion and Jerusalem that there will be a future deliverer and all these concepts lead to a transition 
to what God is going to declare in the next chapter, that he himself is the first and the last and the only true God. And this is historically established in two ways. One, by the Lord God calling and anointing Cyrus for his purpose to deliver Israel and to bring glory to his name through him, right? A pagan uh, king. And then the second is by bringing his son Yeshua, the Messiah, into this world so that he would lay his life down on our behalf and so to deliver and to save us from our sins. Okay, so <laughs> the conclusion of Isaiah 41, verses 1 through 29, uh, the text shows us that God is the only one who can reveal the future and bring it to pass, unlike the idol gods of the nations who are worthless and powerless and they can't do anything, right? And the God of Israel is the source of all wisdom and knowledge. He alone is the one who plans and provides direction and purpose for his people. You know, so this chapter sets the chapter 20, 41 sets the stage for the introduction of God's deliverer with more prophetic texts that are used in the New Testament. You know, God introduces Cyrus as the one whom God has called and anointed for a particular mission. And Cyrus will fulfill God's word and be a blessing to God's people and the nations. And Isaiah 41 contrasts the futility of the idol worship with the faithfulness of God who has chosen Israel as his servant and will not forsake them, but will strengthen them and help them against their enemies. And we're told <coughs> the Lord God Almighty will renew their strength and enable them to soar like eagles. Like we remember when we read in Isaiah 40, verse 31, Hashem will also raise up another servant who will be his witness and a light unto the nations, as we read in Isaiah 42. And Isaiah, in chapter 41, is beginning to lay out the characteristics of the Messiah of God, preparing the way for the climax of the narrative where God will reveal his glory and salvation through the suffering death of the servant that he will bring, who will bear the sins of many and make intercession for them, according to Isaiah chapter 53. We note the historical context. The servant will be despised, he will be rejected of men, but will be exalted and honored by God. You know, read in Isaiah 52 to chapter 53, you'll see this. And the servant will be the ultimate deliverer and redeemer of Israel and the world from, and he will redeem those, uh, us from sin, you know, who believe in him, you know, something no other deliverer has done, nor will ever do, right? And this is something only Yeshua, the Messiah, has done, according to the New Testament text. Okay, so um, <coughs> that's what I have for part two of the study.